program is pre recorded. BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at bcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. And good afternoon. This is Gordon Morris sitting in for Vic Eliason with a special edition of Crosstalk today. In February of 2008 at our BCY America rally in Milwaukee, we had a special guest speaker named Paul Washer. And Paul Washer is becoming well known for his messages, especially to young people. Well, Paul Washer originally became a missionary to Peru, and in fact served as a missionary in that country for some 10 years, and while there founded a missionary society, the Heart Cry Missionary Society, which began by supporting church planters in Peru, but it now supports over 80 missionaries, many of them indigenous missionaries in 15 different countries all across uh, much of the world. But uh, Paul now is perhaps better known because he's back in this country and works in his home church in Alabama, but also speaks periodically at other gatherings, and one of those was the VCY rally in February of 2008. It's a long message. We'll bring you as much of it as we can on today's program. It's entitled, The True Gospel. Here's Paul Washer as he spoke at that February 2008 rally. Tonight, what should I do? Well, I'm going to do what I usually do when I have only one chance to preach to a group of people. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to lay out for you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many of you will probably say, well, why? We know about that. No, you don't. You know about four spiritual laws and you know about five things God wants you to know. And you know how to lead people in decisions and confirm their salvation, even though God is a thousand miles from what you're doing. But you probably don't know much about the gospel. The greatest need. In the evangelical community today is to learn the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in simply surveying the sermons and the witnessing techniques and the methodology of church growth and everything else that I see, I can only come to one conclusion. We know not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look what we've done. We walk up to a man. We say this. Do you know you're a sinner? And if he says yes, then we go on to the next question. Would you like to go to heaven? If he says yes, then we go on to the next question. Would you like to pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart? If he says yes, and he prays that prayer, we ask him if he was sincere. If he says yes, we popishly declare him to be born again. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that methodology and evangelism has done more to hurt this country than every heresy introduced by every cult combined. Millions of people in this country whose lives have never been changed believe themselves born again because we have so reduced the gospel of Jesus Christ that it means now nothing more than a simple decision that will only take five minutes of your time. Now let's look at that for a moment. Do you know you're a sinner? If a person says yes, what does that mean? Absolutely nothing. Go ask the devil if he knows he's a sinner. He'll say, yes, I am, and a mighty fine one at that. The question is not, do you know you're a sinner? The question is this, since you have sat under the preaching of the gospel, has God so worked in your heart that the sin you once loved you now hate? That's the question. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. That's what political theory is all about. That's why we're having an election. Everybody wants a good place to live. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is, as the gospel has been preached to you, has God, God Almighty, so done a sovereign, supernatural work in your heart that the God you once hated and ignored, you now desire and esteem worthy above all things? 
And then, would you like to pray a prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart? You will be hard-pressed to find the biblical basis for that question in the New Testament. You say, oh no, it says, receive Him. Do you honestly think when the Bible speaks about receiving Christ that it's talking about mumbling some little evangelical rite? When it talks about receiving Christ, it is through repentance and faith. It is not taking Him in as some accessory to your life. It is taking Him in as the very sustenance of your life. Christ isn't just something in your life that makes it better. Christ is your life. He is your life. Jesus did not come. It doesn't say in the book of Mark that the time was fulfilled. Jesus did not say that the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, who would like to pray and ask me to come into their heart? But rather, He said, repent and believe the Gospel. And never forget, throughout all the teaching of the New Testament and the Old, Repentance is evidenced by fruit, by the way someone lives. Most people today believe they're saved because they're trusting in the sincerity of their decision and not the work of Christ nor the power of God in salvation. Are you saved? Yes. How do you know? Well, three years ago I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus to come into my heart. Really? And how many others have done that? The evidence of salvation, the evidence of repentance, the evidence of faith is a changed and a changing life. How do you know that you repented unto salvation years ago? Because you continue to repent today. How do you know that you believed unto salvation years ago? Because you continue believing today. How do you know that God had an encounter with you years ago? Because He continues having an encounter with you. Through the work of sanctification, He has not only changed your life, He continues changing your life. But the Gospel we preach today is a ritual. Yes, some people get saved but not because of our preaching, rather in spite of it. God still works, even though we know not the Gospel. Now let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. But by a law of faith. Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones... Others refer to this text as the Acropolis of the Christian faith. The fortified city. The city set on a hill. Many theologians have said if they had to lose all the Bible and could keep only one text, it would be this one. Because in this text is a portion, a fragment, a seed of the Gospel. Now, although there's enough theology here to keep us studying for an eternity. Why do I say a seed or fragment of the Gospel? Let me share with you something. Very, very important before we begin our sermon. Much to do today about the Second Coming. Everybody wants to know about the Second Coming. You will understand everything about the Second Coming on the day it occurs. On the day Jesus comes back, you will understand absolutely everything about how He's going to do it and when He's going to do it. And what exactly will be the signs leading up to Him doing that thing He's going to do? So the day He comes back, you'll understand everything there is to understand about the Second Coming. But you will spend an eternity of eternities in heaven and you still will not begin to comprehend the Gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It is not a message among many. It is the message of Scripture and the message of Christianity. But the sad thing is, it is no longer the message of the church in America. And I can prove it to you. Go to all those bookstores of yours. If we were to think back only 200 years ago, 300 years ago, we would see that the talk of Christianity was about the gospel. The books that were written by the Spurgeons and the Puritans and the Edwards, it was about what is the gospel? How can we comprehend the gospel? How do we preach the gospel? What is true conversion? How can we know when someone has truly been born again? Go into those bookstores of yours today and try to find a volume written on such themes. You'll find nothing. It's all filled with how to and ten steps. There's a big to do today about discipleship, and I believe we ought to do discipleship. But I often hear people saying today, we have so many people coming in through the front door of the church, but the moment they come in, they're leaving through the back door of the church. And the reason why they're not staying is because we're not discipling them. That is not true. The reason why they're not staying is because they were never born again. We got them to make a decision. We got them to raise their hand. But their life never changed. Do we need to do personal discipleship? Of course we do. But if God saves a man, he who began a good work in him will finish it. Why is there so little power today? Because we don't know the gospel. Because we don't concern ourselves with true conversion. Because we don't make the important things important. But we replace it with the proper use of media in the service. With the right kind of singing to alter the mood. With flashy speakers who tell us everything we want to hear so that we can have our best life now because that is indeed what we want. More than God. There is no power because the Gospel is lost. You bring the Gospel back and you'll see the power of God move upon the lives of men, women, and children. The simple Gospel. Now let's look at our text. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't fully understand what that means. Because if you did, you would either be trembling in terror because you know it's not right with you, or you would be rejoicing almost out of control over what God has saved you from. All have sinned. Why does that not move us? Because we do not understand the heinous nature of sin. And why do we not understand the heinous nature of sin? It's because we don't know who God is. We don't know God. I am amazed as as I go through this country and this world and talk to leaders of seminaries and Bible institutes and I ask them questions. I say, how many semesters do your students study theology proper? Simply the doctrines of God. Well, we cover that in a, in you know a month. How many sermons today on the doctrine of God? We're listening to a message by Paul Washer at a VCY America rally in February 2008 on the true gospel. And we'll continue with a portion of this message in just a moment. This is Crosstalk on VCY America. Genesis with theologist Dr. John Morris of the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, what's this about evidence for Noah's flood being discovered in the Black Sea area? Chris, recently an exploration team made big news when they claimed to have found archaeological evidence of a civilization at the bottom of the Black Sea. They postulated that a big flood in the Black Sea area was really the flood of Noah's day, and that its survivors told of it in global terms, leading to the eventual writing of Genesis. Chris, this hokey story is a sort of drivel that comes from theological liberals as they try to minimize the accuracy of God's Word. It certainly ought not to entice Christians into disbelief. The flood they found was a flood which followed the great flood of Noah's day. It was a big flood, probably related to the Ice Age which came after the flood, but it wasn't the great flood, the one mentioned back in Genesis. That one covered the entire world. Thanks, Dr. John. 
For more information, call 1-800-7-GENESIS. Welcome back to today's special edition of Crosstalk. This is Gordon Morris sitting in for Vic Eliasson. We're hearing today a message from Paul Washer on the true gospel as presented at the VCY America rally in February of 2008. Paul Washer, a missionary and missionary society founder, also a well-known speaker, and he's also an author, having written the book, The One True God, A Biblical Study of the Doctrine of God. Once again, here's Paul Washer as he continues his message on the true gospel. In all this getting that we're getting, in all this knowledge, in all these books, in all these bookstores, in all these tapes, in all these conferences, is anybody simply talking about God? Who is He? That is the reason why Sunday morning in America is the greatest hour of idolatry in the whole week. Why? Because most people who are even worshiping God are worshiping a God they don't know. They're worshiping a God that looks more like Santa Claus than the God of Scripture. They're worshiping a God that is a figment of their own imagination. They created a God in their own likeness and they worship the God they've made. And why is that? Again, it goes back to the pulpit. In the pulpit, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And what is that? Teaching men about God so that they might know in the light of His revelation where they stand and what they need. All have sinned. Westminster tells us that means a lack of conformity to the law of God. A deviation from the will of God. A detour from the manifest character of God. Picture this for a moment. God stands there in the creation of the universe and He says, stars, put yourself in the places I have marked out for you. And every star in creation bows and says, Amen. Planets, put yourself in the circles I have drawn for you and stay there until I give you another word. Move exactly as I command you. And they bow and they worship. He tells the mountains to be lifted up. He tells the valleys to be cast down. And they tremble before Him. He tells the sea to come to this point and do not come any further. And the sea obeys. But He looks at man. He looks at you and says, Come. And you go, No! In any debate, in any speaking at a university, the problem with hell in the minds of most men is that it is of eternal duration. How can the punishment go on forever? How can it be, so to speak, an infinite punishment poured out on men because they have sinned against an infinitely worthy God? The crime is punished with such severity because it is a severe crime. And it is a severe crime because of the one against whom they have railed. The God of glory. And if men do not understand the infinite worth of this God, they cannot know the heinous nature of their sin. Even so far today, I've heard one preacher who says, we do not speak about sin in our church, then I can tell him that the Holy Spirit of God does not work in his church nor in his ministry. Why? Because one of the principal ministries of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. So if you do not talk much about sin, count on it. The Holy Spirit is not much in your ministry. But what does it mean to say sin? It means nothing. We live in a culture that drinks down iniquity like it was water. Fish do not know they're wet. Neither do men know what it means to sin against God. And for this very reason, now listen to me, those of you who are going to be preachers one day, we are not to be mean-spirited. We are not to go around seeking zealously to hurt people or break them. But know this, if you are properly going to expound the Word, you must make much of sin. 
You must expose sin. You must define sin. You must explain it specifically so that it, the Word of God cuts into the heart of men. I can prove my point in this. We do not have a systematic theology in Scripture, but the closest we come to that is the book of Romans. And if you will notice in this great treatise of the Apostle Paul, he spends his first three chapters laboring with all his might to do one thing, to condemn the entire world. That is his job. Look over here in chapter 3. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Men must sit under preaching that speaks about the reality of their problem in terms that they can't understand and from which they cannot escape. I always use this illustration. If I were to jingle some keys in front of the microphone tonight, it probably wouldn't make you happy. It probably wouldn't fill your heart full of delight. And why is that? Because you're not locked away in a dungeon to be executed. But if you were locked away in a dungeon knowing that the sentence of death were hanging over your head, then the sound of keys would bring a delight to your heart. I submit to you that men cannot appreciate the Gospel Because of the way we preach. Let me ask you something. At 12 o'clock this day, this afternoon, where did all the stars go? Did someone put them in a basket and carry them all away? Where did they go? They were there. Why couldn't you see them? For all the light. But the stars and the beauty of those stars, they came out, didn't they? In the darkness. So it can be said of the grace of God in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want grace to be seen, then it helps to paint a pitch black night that men might see what they are and in seeing what they truly are. Having their hearts exposed, they will see their need of a Savior. But while you play with them and coddle them, and protect their so-called self-esteem, you at the same time damn their soul to hell. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Men are not just rebels. They are dislocated from what they are to be. They have perverted their entire being and the course of their lives. Why were we made? For what reason does our heart beat? For what reason does our chest heave and draw in breath? There is only one reason. It is for Him. Men were not made for men. This world was not made for men. Men were made for God. And men will be destitute and perverted, and hopeless without Him. Isn't it amazing? I've spent a great deal of my life in the third world. I just returned from basically my second home, Peru, where I was there for a month preaching. The poverty sometimes in the third world is absolutely astounding. Brothers and sisters in Christ suffering so But when I come back to the States, I see something. I see that we as Americans are the wealthiest Christians who ever walked on the face of the earth. We are the most protected Christians that ever walked on the face of the earth. And yet, we are the emptiest Christians who ever walked on the face of the earth. You go into a so-called Christian bookstore today, 75% of the books that are there are dealing with how empty we are. And why are we empty? We're empty for the very reason Jesus never was empty. He said, I have food to eat that you know not of. My food is to do the will of my Father. More and more and more the evangelical church is becoming humanistic, humanistic, humanistic. Everything is about man. We just pronounce a few Christian words over it in order to baptize it and make it look Christian. But everything's about you. Everything's about your felt needs. Everything's about your self-esteem. No! 
That is an endless pit that will suck every ounce of life out of you. You don't need self-esteem. You need the knowledge of God. As a matter of fact, apart from Christ, you shouldn't have any self-esteem. And in Him, you know that it is only in Him that your life is right. Men need God. And they need to be turned toward God. And only then will their lives be corrected. It's all about Him. Your heart beats for Him. You were given breath for Him. You were given strength for Him. You were given a mind for Him. You were given everything you were given for Him. And it is only by living for Him that you're ever going to find purpose or meaning. And even in that, you will not find purpose and meaning if your goal is to find purpose and meaning. For your goal should be His glory. Even if to attain that glory, every bit of purpose is destroyed in your life. It's all about Him, not about us. And that is the fundamental problem with humanity. And the fundamental problem in American Christianity is it's now all about us. A church that I was listening to just recently that has grown to be very, very large. And someone asked the pastor, well, what are you doing? He says, we're simply meeting all the needs of the people. That's not church. And what happens when you can't meet all their needs? What happens when there are soldiers standing at the door that say, if you confess Christ, I'll take away your fine home that Jesus gave you. I'll take away your cars that Jesus gave you. I'll take away your little Izod sweaters that Jesus gave you. If you build churches and build Christianity around this, Jesus will meet all your needs. You will not have Christianity. You will have an exalted humanism and a Jesus who is made a servant of men. The old preachers, giving a hypothetical lesson, were often fond of saying this, you should believe in Jesus Christ you should repent and you should serve Him even if He sends you to hell because He is worthy of repentance, He is worthy of faith, and He is worthy of service, though you get nothing from it. Do you understand that kind of Christianity? Where it's all about Him and not about men. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now speaking about the true believer, he says being justified. What does that mean to be justified? Does it mean that the moment a person places his faith in Jesus Christ, that person is made righteous? No. Because if that were the case, the person would never sin again. Justification, to be justified, is a legal or a forensic term. It means the moment that a person places their faith in Jesus Christ, God legally declares that person to be right with Him. It's a legal declaration coming forth from the throne of God. This sinner is justified. He is legally right with me. Now, how are we justified? This is the question of the ages as a gift by His grace. We're listening to Paul Washer talking about the true gospel at a VCY rally. And we'll continue in just a moment. This is Crosstalk on VCY America. Dr. Rick Warren proposed that his purpose-driven church movement is a new reformation, the greatest paradigm shift in church government since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. Without doubt, the purpose-driven church has become a tremendous force in the world. But Noah Hutchings sees a dark side to this force. He sees it as a movement to unite all religions to produce a one-world church. Noah Hutchings' findings are documented in the book, The Dark Side of the Purpose-Driven Church, which is being offered by VCY America for a donation of $13 or more. The book exposes the process churches are using to convert to the purpose-driven model and how its music, name, and message all change. For a limited time, along with the book, we're also sending 25 copies of the brochure, Is Your Church Going Purpose-Driven? To make your donation of $13 or more, call 1-800-729-9829. 
That's the dark side of the Purpose Driven Church, plus 25 copies of the Purpose Driven brochure. Call 1-800-729-9829. Welcome back to today's special edition of Crosstalk. This is Gordon Morris sitting in for Big Eliason. And today we're listening to a message by Paul Washer on the true gospel presented at the BCY America rally in February of 2008. And we should mention that the entire message is well over an hour long, and so we will not be able to bring you the entire message on today's program. It is available in both audio and video form, however, if you'd like to see or hear the entire message on CD for audio and on a video DVD. And you can uh, obtain that by calling our toll-free number during regular office hours at 1-800-729-9829. Ask for the Paul Washer Rally. That's 1-800-729-9829. Now let's return to the message by Paul Washer at our BCY Rally on the true gospel. Now I want you to notice something here. He says, being justified as a gift. This same word, same phrase, or the same Greek word is used in another text where it says of the Messiah, they hated Him without a cause. Did Jesus Christ ever give anyone a cause to hate Him? No. They hated Him, although they had no reason whatsoever to do so. That's the same thing being taught here. That God declares the sinner right with Him. Without a cause. The sinner never gave God a cause to justify him or declare him right. As a matter of fact, the only thing a sinner could ever motivate a holy God to do is condemn him. But God has done a great work so that the sinner might be made right with God irregardless of all his trespasses, irregardless of all his sins and crimes against deity, God has justified men, even though men never gave him a cause. If we were to set the the three major religions, as they tell us, up here tonight, and we were to ask an Orthodox Jew, if you died right now, where would you go? He might respond, well, I would go to heaven. And why is that? Because I love the law of God. I am a servant of God. I am a righteous man. Then the reporter goes to the Muslim and says, Sir, if you died right now, where would you go? I would go to paradise. Why? I love the Quran. I've made the prayers, the pilgrimages. I give alms to the poor. I am a righteous man. He comes to the Christian, the true Christian. And he says, Sir, if you died right now, where would you go? He says, Heaven. What is the reason for the hope that is within you? And the Christian says, I was born in sin. In sin, my mother conceived me. I have broken every law of God. And I deserve the full extent of His just wrath against me. And the reporter stops him and says, Sir, I don't understand. The other two men I quite understand. They are righteous men. By their own virtue, their own merit and deed. And they believe they're going to heaven because they have done good things. But sir, you bewilder me. You're an enigma. You're telling me that you're going to heaven even though you deserve just the opposite. What is the basis for your hope? And that Christian cries out, I am trusting in the virtue and the merit of another. Jesus Christ, my Lord. All to Him. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. That He died for me. Declared right with God. Even though we gave Him no cause. No cause whatsoever to do anything but to condemn us. A few times in my ministry, this used to happen, it, that song isn't sung anymore much, praise God. But it seemed like every time I'd get up to preach in a meeting, some person would get up and sing a song that asked the question, Oh God, what did you see in me that you saved me? And I felt like a kid at school with his hand raised in the back. Oh, oh pick me, I'll tell you. What did, what did God see in you? 
He saw an object of wrath. He saw someone that had broken every law he'd ever made and lived a dislocated, perverted life. That's what he saw. And why did he save you? Two reasons. God is love. Secondly, to demonstrate His glory, His mercy, His attributes to not only the world, but even beyond. Or that song that was real popular a few years ago where it says, God never gave up on me. That's because He never put any hope in you to start off with. He never gave up on you. Who teaches you these things? He never gave up because He never put hope in you. He put hope in His own promise, in His own oath, in His own covenant. He put hope where hope belongs, in His person, His decrees, and His works. So He justified men, being justified as a gift by His grace, unmerited favor. This is what drives a man of God. This is what drives the woman of God. Grace. 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 The unmerited favor of God through the infinitely valuable sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. We become a prisoner of grace. We become a prisoner of hope. We become a prisoner of the Gospel. I must live for Him. Why? Grace manifested toward me in the person of Christ. I am constrained by that love. He says we are saved by grace. And he goes on and says through the redemption. I forget his name. I should have remembered it. But I've heard tell of an old Puritan that they said that some words he would read in Scripture and after reading them, He would sit silently with a trembling lip because there were some words that were just almost too sacred to say. If we follow that line of thinking, I would say that redemption is one of those. How common that word has become. I remember the first time crossing the Andes Mountains with an old veteran missionary. And I wondered how he could sleep on the train in the midst of all the beauty we were seeing out the window of the train. And then years later, as I was taking a group of young, young uh, men across the Andes Mountains, I realized I did the same. I slept. Some things are so spectacular. And they do not change in character or value. But our hearts become cold. And things become commonplace that we can even think on the word redemption and not weep. It would be enough if we had been bought, because that's what the word means, to to buy, to set someone at liberty, a slave or a captive, by paying a price. It would have been enough. If it had been silver or gold, it would have been enough if it had been some valuable thing in heaven. But it was the blood of God's own Son. And again, that truth is what ought to control us. Appreciate what the young man said up here. Christianity is not about morality. There's a lot of moral people who go to hell. Christianity will result in a biblical morality. But Christianity is not about morality. It's about Him. It's not just about being nice people. It's not just about doing nice things. It's not just about dotting every I and crossing every T. It is about a passion. A heart set on fire because it realizes it has been bought with the blood of God's Son. We have been redeemed. And as it says here in our text, that redemption is in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Possibly the most powerful phrase in the Bible. In Christ. Paul became so enamored with that phrase that when we look at the first chapter of Ephesians, half the chapter is just one long sentence. All of it repeating over and over. In Him. In Christ. In the Beloved. 
You are here tonight in one of two spheres. You are in Adam and condemned, or you are in Christ and justified. A young man came to me one time and said, You're right, Brother Paul. You're right. Jesus is all we need. I said, Young man, Jesus is all we have. He's not just all we need. Outside of Him, there is nothing. You need to understand that that great book of Colossians not only teaches us the world was created by Christ and for Him, it was created in Christ. Everything outside of Jesus Christ is not reality. Everything outside of Jesus Christ is absolutely absurd. Everything outside of Jesus Christ is death. There is nothing. There's no reality. There's no logic. There's no sense. There's no reason. There's no rhyme. Nothing works. Everything was made to be in Christ. People here tonight with so many problems. I have problems, you might say, in my marriage. I have problems in my finances. I have problems here and problems there. Your greatest problem is lashing yourself down to this truth. Total surrender to the person and will of Jesus Christ for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Christ. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Propitiation. Maybe other than the names of God, the most important word in the entire Bible. Do you know what it means? Propitiation. It says God displayed His Son publicly. There is a reason why the Son of God was lifted up in the center of the religious universe. Outside the most important religious city in the world. While He was lifted up on a tree at the crossroads of that great city. God, through the cross of Jesus Christ, is not only saving men, but He is revealing things about Himself. He is making Himself known to the world. Through that cross. Thus it was necessary. This word can also mean that God placarded His Son. Made a public display of His Son. We suppose that God could have put away sin secretly. But He didn't. He made a public display of His Son. For all, not only the world, but all of creation to see. It says that God displayed Him publicly as a propitiation. What is a propitiation? The word propicio. We even use it in, in old Spanish, in the Reina Valera, the old version that we use. Say propicio a mí. Be merciful to me. It is a sacrifice that enables God to demonstrate mercy to the wicked. We're going to further explain that. But now I want to take you to something. Now listen to me. If you can catch this, this one thing I'm going to teach you tonight, this will help you. This is about the cross. This is the cross. It's the reason for it. The reason under it. Why a cross? Why a death? The voice of Paul Washer as he spoke at a VCY rally in February of 2008 with his topic, The True Gospel. We'll continue with one more section of the message and then information on how you may obtain the entire message in either audio or video form as Crosstalk continues in just a moment. This is Crosstalk on VCY America. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. How is the social gospel of the new religious right really any different than the social gospel of the religious left? The social gospel is man-centered. It says that man needs to fix or improve his condition through social activism, Christian activism, philanthropy, and good works. A social gospel leaves out the preaching and teaching that sin is primarily the reason for the problems of our world. Rick Warren's social gospel involves leaving out the biblical gospel so he can work with Muslims and other world religions to improve education, address poverty, disease, and promote globalism. 
the social gospel of the new religious right is primarily about lowering taxes, decreasing the size of government, and giving people more political and economic liberty. The accomplishments of such laudable goals are not going to solve man's root problem of sin and rebellion against God. Let's make sure that we don't confuse our conservative activism with the preaching of the gospel. Welcome back to the final portion of today's special edition of Cross Talk. This is Gordon Morris sitting in for Vic Eliasson. And we're hearing portions of a message by Paul Washer at a VCY rally in February of 2008 on the true gospel. If you order today's Crosstalk program on CD, you'll actually receive the entire audio of the rally, not just the portions heard on this program. And the video is also available on a DVD. Call 1-800-729-9829 during regular office hours to order either the audio or the video. Now one more portion of the message by Paul Washer on the true gospel. The greatest problem in all the Bible is found in an obscure text in Proverbs. Let's just go there for a moment. Proverbs 17, 15. Listen to the text. He who justifies the wicked and who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. And you say, well, what's that have to do with the gospel? All right, let's put the first and second, the first and last part together. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Anyone, especially authority, such as a judge or a king, anyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. What's an abomination? It's probably the hardest word in Scripture. Something that's loathsome. Something that is disgusting, vile, heinous, unspeakably wicked. So anyone who justifies a wicked man, anyone who legally declares a wicked man to be right is an abomination before God. Do any of you see the problem? For the last 20 minutes, what have I spoken of? God has justified the wicked. And yet, and Scripture cannot be broken, to justify the wicked is an abomination to God. And that is what the Gospel is all about. And many of you have never even heard that before. The greatest problem in all of Scripture is this. If God is just, He cannot forgive you. You say, well, why not? By that question, you're just demonstrating that you're a child of your culture that knows nothing of justice. God is holy. God is just. God cannot simply turn His back on sin. He cannot simply look over your sin. He cannot simply pardon you. If God is just, He must judge you righteously. And a righteous judgment means your death in hell forever. The greatest question in all the Bible is how can God be just and the justifier of the wicked? Look what Paul says here. Verse 26, For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier. This is the problem. This is what the cross is all about. This is the divine dilemma. If God is just... How can He justly forgive wicked men and declare them to be legally right before Him? Let me give you an illustration that I've used a million times. Let's say that you were to go home from this preaching tonight and find your family has been slaughtered. And you see the the assassin standing before the last one with a little bit of life in their body. He breaks their neck and drops them to the floor and laughs. He runs out the door, you run out the other door, you knock him to the ground. You bind his hands and you call the police. The police come and pick up this man who has murdered your entire family and they lock him away. And then, in due time, they present him before the judge. The judge looks down at the man who has murdered your entire family and he says this, I am a very loving judge. I pardon you. Go free. What is going to be your response? 
You're going to demand justice. You're going to write the newspapers. You're going to call the television stations. You're going to write congressmen. You're going to say that there is a judge on the bench far more wicked than the criminals he pardons. There is something even in you that cries out for justice. This cannot be. Then shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I have heard evangelists say this, not knowing that they were speaking blasphemies and heresies against God. I've heard them say, instead of being just with you, God was loving. You know what they're saying? God's love is unjust. That God can be unjust. There is, even among our race of people, a what? An unjust love. People love things unjustly. They demonstrate affection in a wicked way. You cannot say and be biblical that instead of being just, God was loving. God's love must be just. God must satisfy justice that cries out against you because of your sin. Now, it's not as some suppose. Some people will think, well, there's, are you saying that there's this rule of justice that even God has to submit to? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, God Himself is just. And God is perfect and consistent in all His attributes. In order to pardon the wicked, the justice of God must first be satisfied and the wrath of God appeased. Someone must interpose. Someone must intervene. Someone must do something. And being there's only two parties, one being God and the other man, we put no hope in man. God Himself must intervene to satisfy His justice, appease His wrath, and make it possible to express His love and salvation toward wicked men. We've been listening to portions of a message by Paul Washer presented at a VCY rally in 2007 on the true gospel. And on today's program, we've had time to bring you perhaps a little more than half of that message. The entire message is well over an hour long. It is available in audio form on CD. In fact, if you order today's Crosstalk program, you'll actually receive the entire message, not the program, so you'll hear the entire message from the rally. And it's available on DVD video. Request your copy of the message by Paul Washer on the true gospel. Contact VCY America during regular business hours at 1-800-729-9829. 1-800-729-9829. Or you may also mail in your request. We'll give you the address in just a moment. That's our time on today's Crosstalk program. I'm Gordon Morris, sitting in for Vic Eliason. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from VCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208, or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.